I'm Scott Payton, the State Director for Right on Crime for Louisiana, Mississippi. I'm here with Kevin Roberts, the President of the Heritage Foundation. Uh, Kevin, welcome and thank you um, for coming to Baton Rouge and for sitting down to talk with me for a few minutes about criminal justice policies, not just here in Louisiana and Mississippi, but across the nation. Uh, when we last um, met in person, you were the President or CEO of the Texas Public Policy Foundation, so congratulations on becoming the president of the Heritage Foundation. Uh, we'll go ahead and just jump right in. Um, for over a decade, um, as a national initiative of the Texas Public Policy Foundation, Right on Crime has been championing uh, conservative criminal justice policies uh, throughout the United States. Um, as CEO of TPPF, you oversaw the Right on Crime uh, initiative and, and helped it grow from just a few states to, to where it is today. Uh, in, in your opinion, why should conservatives and conservative values take lead in criminal justice policies, uh, again, not just here in Louisiana and Mississippi, but across the nation? Well, two reasons, Scott, and, and thanks, by the way, for all the work that you do in Louisiana, Mississippi, and elsewhere. But those two reasons are, first and foremost, what defines us as conservatives. And so before we get to things like taxation and for that matter, regulation, we're focused about, are focused on the human person. And we understand that every human person, regardless of what he or she has decided to do with their free will, has dignity. And therefore, especially for first time nonviolent offenders, who our research and work shows over 15 years have a chance not just to come out of prison and be okay, but to be flourishing members of society, that's where criminal justice reform really needs to be focused. The second reason is there is a lot of conversation today about the rule of law, about rising crime rates, about a porous southern border. One of the ways that we can honor the rule of law is to make sure that there is proportion in sentencing. That in fact, going back to first time nonviolent offenders, these are people who are very likely with no programs for mitigating whatever their underlying issue is, are going to be repeat offenders. But if we can allocate public resources into rehabilitating them rather than imprisoning them two, three, five, ten times in their lifetimes, not only do we honor their dignity, but to come full circle in this response, we're also building the rule of law. It isn't necessarily the first way that conservatives would think about it because we are law and order. You know me well, I'm a law and order guy first. But part of being a law and order guy first is to make sure the resources we spend on the criminal justice system are on the bad guys, not on the guys and gals who simply made a mistake, and they did, and they need to, to pay their price with some, some term. But when they come out, we don't want them to go back in and become even worse. I, I certainly uh, agree with you, and um, glad you mentioned Law and Order. It's one of my favorite television shows. <laughs> it, it puts me to bed uh, on many sleepless nights. But the iconic opening line, um, you know, about halfway through the middle says there's two separate but equally important groups, and, and it's referring to the criminal justice system, and one it says law enforcement who investigates the crime, and then the district attorneys who prosecute the offenders. Uh, we have seen the news from LA to New York, uh, what's happening with progressive or liberal district attorneys. Uh, here in Louisiana, our district attorneys uh, are one of the most powerful elected officials in their parishes. Um, they're elected for six-year terms. Uh, we possibly could be just one election away uh, here in Louisiana and many other states of having a district attorney um, that could carry things way too far to, to the left. Uh, there's an old saying, if you lean too far to the left of the boat or too far to the right, either way you fall out the boat and, and it's not good for, for either, either policy. Um, what are your thoughts on prosecutorial reform, and, and again, not just here in Louisiana and Mississippi, but, but just in general, um, how can we hold them to be accountable and transparent so that we can ensure that they do what the law and order tagline says to prosecute the offenders equally um, and, and with, with fairness and justice? Well, I'll answer your question specifically in a moment, but let me start with some context, which is underscoring the rationale you laid out in the preamble to your question. 
And this may come as a surprise to some people watching this, that in other words, those of us who are law and order types think that the district attorneys, the prosecuting attorneys are the good guys. And generally we would like to think that they are. But the problem is they're very abusive. And frankly, they've been perhaps most abusive here in Louisiana. And the reason they have is not because of law and order. The reason they have is not because they're quote unquote conservative. The reason is because of corruption and ego. And therefore, it leads me to a specific answer to your question, which is really the answer to every public policy question, and that's transparency. So you're the expert on the specifics being advocated here in Louisiana and Mississippi and, and other states. What we need to do is make sure that wherever there is the potential for darkness, and obviously there is, in some of these offices of district attorneys in Louisiana that we're able to shine light on there. So legislative reforms have to really shine the light brightly. It's, it's almost impossible to do too much of that moving forward. But let me sum up this response with a sort of call to action. About five years ago, our colleagues at the Texas Public Policy Foundation indicated to me that in Texas there was a disproportionate amount of campaign money from the left coming in for district attorney races. And at first I thought, man, that sounds a little conspiratorial that it's going to be George Soros money that's focused on these races. I'm telling you that's exactly what happened to the tune of tens of millions of dollars. It may even be $100 million spent on district attorney races there over the last three cycles. That's beginning to happen in Louisiana, to the, to the point of your question. And the reforms that you're advocating have to be put in place in order to stop that. I, I agree as well. And, um, you know, here in Louisiana, we have not seen um, to, to, to the scale that we're, that we're seeing in New York and right. Los Angeles. But the potential is there, the framework right. is there, that they can do this without, you know, breaking any laws um, and without the general public even knowing what's going on. Yeah. Uh, we, we don't hear a lot of cries. Um, we have an extreme example of someone that was sentenced to life for stealing a pair of hedge clippers, um, you know, in one area. So that's one of these far extreme right and then you have where where people aren't being prosecuted at all. Yeah, so, and, that's, and that's the problem. And that, that is that is a big issue because the law enforcement side, uh, we're hearing fund, defund, depends on what day of the week, but that, that group is, just like the tagline says, equally important and the prosecutors have a role to play, but the transparency and accountability is, is definitely what we have to continue working on here in Louisiana and across the nation as well so that we don't end up uh, being like uh, New York or Los Angeles. Yeah, and, and frankly, some districts in Texas, which may come as a surprise, that there are some locales in Texas where this is a real problem. Well, hopefully we can uh, we can battle that here <laughs> in, in Louisiana and um, and you can tackle that um, on a larger scale from, um, from the swamp in D.C. I'll, I'll add so, that to my list. Yes, I'm sure it's a short <laughs> list. Uh, and you touched on it, and, and I've touched on it in some of my questions, but as conservatives, we view criminal justice policy through the lens of public safety right. and through victims' rights. Um, victims are the, there is a consumer of the criminal justice system, it, it would be victims. Here in Louisiana, there was a poll a few years back where most people, about half, agreed with reforms in general. Mm -hmm. uh, but an overwhelming number of people did not trust criminal justice system right um, and a lot of that is because of recidivism mm -hmm. people returning back to prison mm -hmm. and it's a it's a revolving door um, as a probation and parole officer you know for a little over a decade I, I saw the importance of reentry and the need that individuals had either coming out of prison or those that were placed on probation mm -hmm. to address certain whatever issues underlying issues that they had um, what's your thoughts on and you mentioned a little bit earlier in, in your first answer on providing second chances, providing that opportunity for individuals who have served the time that mm -hmm. the courts gave them, and now they're back in society trying to reintegrate, but they're running into barriers because of that stigma of a felony conviction. Well, I'll be candid, uh, blunt, uh, on two points. The first is I have zero interest, zero interest. The Heritage Foundation has zero interest in doing anything to help hardened criminal cases criminals who need to spend time in prison. You would agree with that entirely. Yes. Therefore, the second equally important point is making sure that we're allocating resources on those bad guys and gals gives us the opportunity to make sure that something that had been happening for the preceding 25 years prior to right on crime 
which is that not only are we wasting resources by keeping in prison first-time nonviolent offenders, by virtue of their being in prison, they're high, uh, much more likely to be, become repeat, repeat offenders. You've got to spend money on rehabilitating the problem. Otherwise, the costs, both in terms of state budget as well as human costs, are too high. Where those reforms have happened, in Texas, in Tennessee, in Georgia, scores of other states, we have data that shows that is the right way to approach it. And, and it's a little difficult in terms of messaging right now because people may hear that there are increased crime rates and they associate that with these programs. Actually, the correlation is in the other direction. The correlation is in the direction of a, a leftist agenda that wants to weaken the ability of prosecutors to prosecute crimes, to divert resources in the worst possible way away from those who just need to be in prison for their lifetimes and rather than focused on those who need to come out. Uh, we have so many success stories, and I don't mean this in an anecdotal way, you've got the evidence that proves it, of people who have benefited from this, but I would sum up by saying, it isn't just those who are in prison, who serve their time, who benefit from this. As a society, we benefit from it, because when society honors the rule of law, when society honors the dignity of every human person, when society honors that someone who committed a crime serves the crime, it is just as important that we honor that they serve that crime and they should come out and be people who are fulfilling, flourishing lives as we do being focused on sending them there. That's the conservative message on criminal justice reform. And I will just say that it's deep south states like Louisiana and Mississippi that have the most work to do to get there. And you, my friend, are doing a great job of doing it. Thank, thank you, Kevin. I appreciate that. And, and, and you're right. We have here in Louisiana and, and in Mississippi, uh, we go back and forth with the highest incarceration yeah. rate. We have some of the highest crime rates. And, and you're, you're correct in saying those rates were high prior to COVID, prior to the spike in, in violent crime that we're seeing across the, the nation. Um, you know, 95% of the people that are sent to prison come back. Mm -hmm. And we have to make sure that, that and it's not... You know, we firmly believe in personal responsibility. Mm -hmm. They need that hand up, not the hand out. And they need initial things to, to get moving so that they don't return. We That's spend right. $700 million a year on our corrections budget here in Louisiana. Um, I can think of about 100 other things that we could spend that money on that directly relate to our, our high rate of incarceration, That's our right. high crime rate. So um, finding a, a, a better effective way that keeps public safety as the main focus and victims, if public safety is first, victims' rights are, are logically next um, and we can have a safer state which will contribute to our economy, we'll have more people moving here, uh, we can be like our neighbor to the west in, in Texas. So. Well, and increasingly, you know, you're not your adjacent neighbor, but neighbors like Tennessee and Florida and this, this is part of a much broader agenda uh, that you are, are part of where we're making sure that the very precious resources we have in the state budget are spent on things that, that actually help people flourish rather than some legacy system that not only is a useless waste of money but is actually harmful to all of us. Yes. Well, Kevin, you are a good friend, a great American, and a solid conservative voice, and uh, we, we hate to lose you uh, in, in Texas and at TPPF, but we're glad that you're in D.C. because uh, we definitely need you there now. Well, that's kind of you, Scott. It's a pleasure to do the Lord's work in the Devil City. Uh, so keep up your great work. Heritage looks forward to continuing to support it. Thank you, Kevin. You bet.